Thank you very much once again for inviting me. I'm very uh, honored to be here. Uh, as I understand that you are a very experienced group of people when it comes to these matters. And uh, I am by no means an expert. I'm a practitioner. I work on the field, um, working with the people. And uh, I heard uh, Mark mention that these are difficult times. And in difficult times, it's more important than ever to remember the philosophy behind restorative justice, which is talking, dialogue. because I believe that we can use words, even though we not always know uh, the outcome of our words, and even though we don't always know which words to utter, to say, we still have to try to use words, to reach each other on a personal level. And again, that is, of course, at the heart of restorative justice, to become personal, which is difficult because you are so far away. Uh, we are in a setting that is uh, very often the opposite of what's happening in the, the mediation room. Uh, and this is also one of the difficulties, of course, uh, as Mark mentioned, a different paradigm. It's on a personal level uh, we keep dialogue in restorative justice, uh, where people are allowed to say what's on their mind and in their heart, they are allowed to change their story as the story develops uh, and as they remember more and more things, maybe talk to more and more people. Uh, and it's also confidential rather than an open uh, process, which of course, again, is, is different. And I remember um, working on a national level in, in Sweden, and one of the... Uh, the, the the chair of the prosecutor on the national level said, um, mediation, victim offender mediation, is such a strange bird. So we don't quite know what to do with this strange bird. And I thought, yes, that's a, a very well uh, put way. It is a strange bird for a lot of people. And the same uh, uh, we encountered from the European Forum uh, in the EU that many of the members of parliament, although they say they know what restorative justice is, they don't really know. Because working on the ground level, it's a lot of logistics. And you, some of you may know this, that it's a lot of getting people together on times that suit everybody in the right setting. So a lot of logistics. Okay, uh, I'm gonna talk for 45 minutes, uh, and then I'm going to leave room for questions and answers. And I have uh, uh, what I'm going to what, what I'm going to say um, is, in a sense, in your handout. So you've got everything I'm going to say in your handout. The PowerPoint presentation follows the handout, uh, so I don't think you need to write very much. Uh, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background of Sweden because it is important, uh, and then I will say that my, I, I, will, I will impart my personal experience. Some of it you will recognize, uh, some of it will be relevant, others may not be so relevant. So just discard those things that are not relevant to you. But a little bit about Sweden, because it is important when we talk about these matters, because uh, the foundation is slightly different. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about um, uh, the history very shortly. And then I'm going to follow the law when I describe uh, the different parts of how this works. And then uh, go into dialogue and mediation after serious crime. And then talk about lessons learned. And then if I remember, I'll mention a little bit about domestic violence or gender violence. Uh, in the setting of restorative justice, and also in the setting of the police. And then uh, I give, hopefully give some examples, and then questions and answers. So, who am I? You mentioned that. Uh, I'm a practitioner. 
And as Mark mentioned, I, I lived in the UK and uh, was one of the founding members of what was then called Devon, uh, Devon Mediation Service. We worked with community mediation, uh, which is uh, mediation in the wider uh, sense. And I would say at that time we did not speak about restorative justice so much. Uh, restorative justice as, as um, um, has come in, 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 into the mediation world, I would say, in the last past 10 years, uh, or maybe since the end of the 90s. But we talked about mediation. Uh, and then I moved back to Sweden, and I, I remember this very clearly. I came to the, uh, to the agency for getting work, and I said, I'm a mediator, and I work with primarily conflicts between neighbors. And they said, we don't have any conflicts between neighbors in Sweden. But we do have a lot of conflicts in school. And so I thought, OK. So I wrote a, a book about peer mediation, which is uh, mediation in schools, which I also had worked with. Uh, but very soon I discovered there were a lot of conflicts between neighbors. Because in Sweden, we have a peculiar system that only exists in Sweden. When you live in block of flats, in a flat apartment, either you rent the apartment or you own it you have a communal laundry at the basement. So it's not very common that people have their own uh, washing machine in their flat. Traditionally, they have it in the, in the basement. So you share the washing machines with everybody else in the house. And it's, of course, free, but you have to book your time. And this booking your time is a large area of conflict. And then also because the, the laundry then becomes semi-private, right? It's not private uh, because it's shared by the rest of the members of the house, so it's kind of semi-private. And of course, people's values will clash. Values of, can I wash my, or handle my clean laundry where you have your dirty washing, right? Well, you can imagine that this is a source of conflict, and it really is the source of conflict, to the, to, to, the, to, to, the, to the results of actually people killing each other. Because they're usually in the basement, uh, difficult to get to, no light, no escape routes, etc. So, of course, we deal with, with this as well. Uh, and those uh, incidents can also become uh, cr criminal matters and then go to victim-offender mediation. Uh, another uh, area that is very peculiar to the Scandinavian countries is the long tradition of governmental and municipal, municipal um, work, uh, where people feel they have a great influence, uh, rather a flat tradition, uh, which I think um, differs uh, from a, uh, certainly from the UK which have more of a hierarchical uh, tradition. So here in Sweden, it's a flat tradition, um, and uh, people want to have a say. They want to be part of making decisions. And I'm thinking uh, of uh, this day, where you are meeting from different cultures, um, from a social work, psychological culture, and I see from the police, uh, maybe also from the cross prosecutors and, and the judges, cultures that actually traditionally are very different and don't traditionally uh, work together because they have different purpose, different goals of the profession. And my experience is that people are usually very happy uh, to meet in this way because they don't get to do it enough to get an insight into what other cultures, or other professions that actually are dealing with the same group of people actually do. And this becomes very apparent in Sweden because we have the confidentiality of the different agencies. So the police will not disclose anything to the social services nor to the mediators that hasn't been permitted by the offender of the, or, or of the victim. This is a difficulty because uh, it's also possible to hide behind the confidentiality, which is very often done, especially if you don't know who is the mediator or who is the social worker or who, who, who is the probation officer. So getting to know each other, like we're doing here today, 
is also in the essence of restorative justice, and of course on the personal level. And, and this we also see as one of the uh, factors that are success factors when it comes to implementing this strange bird uh, within the traditional system. I have also been part of, uh, when I moved back to Sweden, to found the Swedish Forum for Mediation and Conflict Management, as well as the Nordic Forum for Mediation and Conflict Management. Um, Swedes are a, a, a people of um, voluntary NGO uh, workers. All Swedish people belong to at least five different voluntary organizations uh, in one way or the other. Um, so this is not very strange. Um, sometimes it's not about helping, but very often about having a good hobby. Sweden is also a country of uh, doing evaluations of things before we start things. And this differs to, for example, Norway, where in Norway, who is uh, the country where we look up to when it comes to restorative justice, uh, primarily because Nils Christie who is one of the grand old men or people of, of, of RJ, who wrote, as you should, uh, probably know, uh, a very famous article, 1977, Conflicts as Property. Uh, and, and in Norway, um, when they want to make a change, they say, this sounds uh, interesting, uh, let's uh, make a new law so we can work with this. And then it's quite easy and quite a short process of making a new law. And then they start working. While in Sweden, we want to evaluate it. So we make one evaluation, and then we send the evaluation to different agencies, and they look at it and evaluate it, and then it goes back to the uh, government, and then the government uh, either decides that they will give the task of implementing to uh, one of the agencies or not, because they may send it on to an evaluation once more. So to start something usually takes at least five years very slow process. Anyway, in 1998, when I moved back, uh, I came back to Sweden uh, when we had, um, um, uh, how do you say, not research, but we had, uh, we tried out restorative justice in certain municipalities. And the commission to do this was at the National Council for Crime Prevention. Uh, this was very interesting, and uh, we had, uh, at that point, a socialist government, and I think this is important uh, uh, to remember, because uh, the Minister of Justice was in favor of restorative justice and to give a lot of support to the victim services. Uh, we also, in Sweden, have uh, the uh, Victim uh, Compensation and Support Authority, that doesn't just give compensation to victims, but also support victims. And this, as well as uh, the victim support organizations that are uh, the voluntary organizations. So the victim movement in Sweden is very strong. Uh, I would say very strong on paper. Reality is not always the same as the paper. Anyway, we had this uh, Minister of Justice who was instrumental in passing the law. Oh, I'm going to remember this as well. Um, and the law was passed in, uh, on July 2002, and the implementation started uh, on the 1st of January 2003. And when it, the government commissions an agency to, to work with a certain area, this is what is done. An agency will not work with anything that isn't commissioned, which is one of the weaknesses as well of the Swedish system, I would say. Uh, I was not part of this commission uh, from the very beginning, uh, because there were two other people that had worked within the National Council for Crime Prevention. Uh, which was eventually the agency that got the commission. And the reason was that no agency wanted it. No agency wanted it. Uh, everybody wanted the agency of social services to have the commission, but they didn't want it. They said, this is nothing for us. Uh, and there were certain forces that wanted um, they, uh, the Justice Ministry to have the commission, and they didn't want it either. But we said, well, it is the law, uh, and it is part of your uh, governing. 
but it was too strange, I think, uh, for most of the agencies. But eventually it was decided that the National Council for Crime Prevention had to have it. And they were very reluctant to receive it. And although there was a lot of finances put into the project and into the secretariat, um, I would say they didn't work with it efficient enough. And after uh, almost a year, uh, they saw that, for example, training that was one of the focus areas was not being uh, done uh, enough. They hadn't trained enough people. They hadn't been able to move the project forward as much as they had wanted. Also remembering that the, com uh, the commission was for one year at the time. And when it comes to implementing such a profound a new system, which I, I really think it is, one year is um, like a second. It's like a drop in the ocean. Here we need uh, at least six generations to make a change, I would say. Uh, now, that's an exaggeration, but we need to look at a much uh, longer time scale to be able to implement this way of thinking, uh, which really does look at people rather than uh, at a system. So the people that were running the secretariat after a year uh, left, and uh, the manager was looking for somebody else, and they found me. So I said, OK, sounds fun to be able to work at the national level uh, and to see how I could uh, develop together with uh, the manager and a colleague at the secretariat. Now, when I came, there was already a staff of trainers that had begun a training program. And this is also quite interesting because, um, I'm just going to see if I need to press this button again. Mm -hmm. um, because um, they had decided on a very short training, uh, five days. And that is because we were looking towards Norway, who has uh, a victim offender mediation resting on an ideological basis, uh, going back to these conflicts as property, that it should be uh, volunteers, ordinary people in the community, helping people solve conflicts. In Sweden, we wanted to be a bit broader. We liked this idea, but we didn't want to close uh, for being uh, using professionals either. But coming into this, where they already had started an idea of five days, I thought, I can't go and change things, because then we are going to have a lot of rebellious children, adults being children. Ex uh, um, not doing or wanting to do what I think is important. So it's important then to work together, find contact points in Sweden. And remembering, Sweden has nine million people. In Catalonia, you have seven million, if I understand it. So almost the same, oh, give or take two million. But a huge country in Sweden is with area. And I would say Stockholm is one third up, so the people live on the one third at the bottom, and then you have two thirds of wilderness. But because it's a democracy, uh, you know, the people on the north uh, should also have the same resources as the ones in the south. Sometimes this is very difficult and requires traveling for me to Livlio. Well, I could go to Rome, and it's the same distance for me to travel to the north of Sweden as it is to go to Rome. So it gives you a sense of the distances. Uh, the huge distances of this country. So it was important to work together. Now, uh, part of um, the commission was also uh, to work with the cooperative part par partners in central government. So I had the National Police Board, the Prosecutor General, uh, the National Board of Health and Welfare, the Victim Support Organizations, both the, the uh, National Authority, the Victim compensation support authority, as well as the victim support organizations. Uh, I had the bar associations, uh, the National Prisons and Probation Administration, and also 
and organizations for the different uh, municipalities on a national level because uh, this organization is the ones that allocate the money, the funding into the municipalities. So this was my, my steering group and we met at least twice a year. Uh, but that, of course, wasn't enough. We needed to find uh, regional uh, contact points. And then, uh, at the beginning, I had the contact points that had worked with mediation and restorative justice for a long time. And they, of course, were the natural contact points. But they didn't cover the whole of Sweden. And, and uh, we couldn't, as a secretariat, go out and, and say to the different regions, please ask for money to become a regional contact point, because that wasn't in our commissions. And you see, in Sweden, we follow the rules very, very carefully. We don't go outside. The first day at my job, uh, when I came into the National Council for Crime Prevention, was that my manager said, now you're a civil servant. You have to behave as a civil servant, and you must only say which is within the remits of a civil servant. And I went, okay. I'm used to be able to say what I, what I want. And the first day of, of the work was um, the annual conference for the prosecutors in Stockholm. 400 prosecutors. And I had to talk about restorative justice in front of a very, very critical audience. So that was like a, the start of fire. Uh, but it worked. It worked. So um, following the rules is very important. Um, that's why we have to have the law, of course. Um, that's right. Finding the good working partners. Uh, eventually, we were able to find regional contact points all over Sweden, which were the ones I was working with and who in their turn were working out in the municipalities. And, and Sweden has 291 municipalities, uh, and we have about 22 regions. And the police is also uh, have the same organization uh, uh, within the regions. Unfortunately, the prosecutor don't. They have different, different organizations, which make it very difficult uh, when you want to work together. So, um, you have this law in your um, handouts, and uh, I think uh, this, is, uh, this is very important for working uh, with these things in Sweden, because without the law to fall back upon, uh, we would never succeed. And which you don't in Sweden, I would say. Um, then, uh, with no law, there would be perhaps somebody that thinks this is very important and, and works very well in one area, while in other areas of Sweden there wouldn't be any work at all. And one of the important aspects of victim offender mediation is uh, the aspect of equality, uh, and I forgot the, the legal term now, uh, but it should be the same for all members, for all members, in, uh, Swedish members and non-members, of course. It's the same for everybody. And to make it the same, uh, we have to have a law uh, to fall back upon. Now, uh, within the legal system as well, uh, we couldn't fit the law anywhere. So they had to make a completely separate law. And it's only 10 paragraphs, very easy to remember. And it's all based on the... So uh, it's not um, being very specific, this law. It's a very open law. Uh, the first paragraph just tells us who can work with mediation. And uh, it's interesting, uh, when I yesterday got some information of how things work here in Catalonia, um, so um, it's either municipalities, or it's government agencies that can work with mediation, but those uh, agencies can also um, give the commission to private consultants, of course.
And I think now, when we don't have a social democratic uh, government any longer, this is uh, the way that we are going in Sweden. More and more private consultants doing the work that previously were done by municipalities and, and um, by government agencies. And, and uh, this is a change. It's a great change. So it's a very open of who can work with that. Also, it says here, um, why? Why is this important? Well, it is important to give insight for the offender and to help the victim to go uh, proceed uh, towards uh, better health, uh, to, feel, to feeling better, very soft, the soft area. And again, uh, this is a law, and then we have a reality, and the rea reality in Sweden, as in many can countries in Europe, is that the uh, national agencies are focused on offenders. Um, the, the, the national cooperative partners that I was talking about uh, earlier, like the police, prosecutors, judges, social, social services, they are all focused on, on offenders. And they don't know, in a sense, how to work with victims. And in the judicial processes, um, the victims are ignored although I know that it is one of the few countries that actually are working very well with victims. So they are ignored. And most, most ordinary people never really come in contact with the uh, justice process. And when they are, or when they become a victim, and they, for the first time, come into court, they usually feel more victimized through that court process than through the actual crime that they were, uh, that happened to them. Many, ma many victims say this. Even though there will be a victim support person outside, they are questioned and their story is disseminated, mm. really questioned within the court proceedings. And, and most victims are shocked. They are shocked uh, by this process, of course. So um, they feel victimized through the justice process. Uh, there, of course, are uh, some that don't, but the majority does, because, because they don't know. They don't know. Mm. So, um, restorative justice rests on these two pillars, the victim and the offender. Uh, then we have the paragraph four. The mediator should be a competent, honest, just, and partial person. Um, when the government had the, uh, gave the commission to the National Council for Crime Prevention, uh, the focus was uh, primarily on, on training and on implementation and developing the method. And we were very uh, careful in who could train. From 2008, the commission uh, left the National Council for Crime Prevention and it became uh, responsibility of the agency of the social services. But all they do is that if somebody is not happy with mediation, you can complain to the social services, or, uh, the agency of the social services. They don't have a secretariat. There is not any longer a, a national uh, board that uh, runs restorative justice, unfortunately. And we see that uh, since 2008, um, when it comes to training, uh, it has deteriorated because anybody can train and anybody can do anything. Now you think, oh, this is crazy, yeah. Uh, but this is, of course, a question of money because if this was the responsibility in Sweden of the Agency of the Social Service, Services, they would have to make sure that the standard was up to scratch. And this would cost too much money. Uh, so it's, a, it's purely uh, uh, financial reason at this point in time. Um, continuing, um, this process is a voluntary process. And I think um, this is one of the difficulties of the justice system. Because uh, it is, I say voluntary within citation marks. Because when we talk about young offenders, 
under the age of 18. Uh, the, uh, to present something that is voluntary is always questionable if this really is voluntary. But um, it is important because now again we come back to the values underpinning. Why do we do this? Why do we do this? Well, because punishment doesn't work. We have uh, sometimes, or at least in Sweden now, harsher punishment than we've had for a long time. But crime doesn't diminish. It doesn't diminish. So we need to look at different uh, methods and try different methods. And, and although this isn't a universal method for making everything better, it's certainly, if we look at me methods that the social services works with on the whole, this is a very uh, successful method. Uh, we're talking perhaps one or two percentages above other successful me uh, methods, if, if you look at the research. Uh, and also because it's personal. Now, um, if we look at the focus grou group within um, how we work with this for the moment, it is young offenders, uh, primarily, under the age of 21 now. Uh, and it is, again, offender-oriented. Uh, if you, a young offender has committed a crime, uh, and uh, the first uh, meeting at the, with the police, and in Sweden now, the police is also the investigating, uh, takes on the role of the investigating prosecutor from the 1st of July this year. So uh, the police runs the prosecution. Uh, the police has the task of asking the young offender or, and or the young offender's uh, mother and father um, if the mediation service can uh, contact. If they say yes, they're supposed to send this message to the mediation service, providing there is a mediation service within the municipality, of course. And it is on the same piece of paper that is sent to the agency of social services, explaining that this offender has had a meeting because of crime, that they, this offender has admitted uh, to the social services. Now, this is supposed to work, but it, of course it doesn't. Reality is very different. If we look at last year, we only had about 3,500 cases to mediation. And that perhaps uh, is just a fraction of all the cases that have admitted guilt. So it d doesn't really work as well as we would love, like to. Now, if the offender says, no, I don't want the mediator to contact me or us, because there may be too many things happening at the police station. And they may, uh, the, the offender may have heard that you should say no to everything. You shouldn't admit guilt at all. Um, if that's the case, then the social services can put the question. And if it is an offender that is over 18 years of age and will go through the probation system, then the probation officer is the one that poses the question. And this is also interesting because as uh, we have used the law and restorative justice for a while, we see that there are more and more uh, questions or coming from the probation officers on of mediation. Um, and as I said, the law uh, only goes up to uh, the age of 21 for the offender, but no age is excluded. But municipalities always want to uh, save on money, so they try not to offer restorative justice to offenders above the age of 21. Um, I think this is nothing I want to go into. Uh, So, I'm very aware of time. I usually say that I need a day to get started and I now I have 45 minutes. So I want to um, move forward um, to after 2008 uh, and talk a little bit on dialogue and mediation after serious crime. 
because uh, when the Commission left the National Council for Crime Prevention and went over to the Agency of Social Services, it became less, um, uh, less uh, restricted. And I was working with a colleague at the uh, Victim Support uh, Services on the West Coast. And we were thinking in the concepts because uh, in Sweden we start with asking the offender if they're interested in uh, continuing with uh, victim offender mediation. And if the offender says no, we never contact the victim. Um, so not all victims get to know about uh, restorative justice, victim offender mediation. And also if the victim uh, was in a crime where the offender was above 21 years of age. They would anyway not get the question. And we didn't think this was fair. This was not fair uh, for the victim. So they, they were excluded from getting the information, getting asked to be part in, in one of these processes. And, and having worked uh, with restorative justice for a long time, uh, it's not just a meeting between a victim and an offender. It could be circles of different kinds where more people uh, within the community is invited, maybe as many as 20 people. There could be the legal guardians, the mothers and fathers, other family members. It can be other, other important people in the community like teachers, social workers, the person owning the shop down the corner where the, perhaps the crime took place and so on. And all these different ways of conducting dialogue is part of, actually, the Swedish law. Um, so we were interested also in all those victims that had been uh, victimized through a crime that took place a long time ago. Because um, when we look at young offenders, we usually want to have the, the meeting uh, before the trial but as you know, working with the victims of serious crime, um, talking about two to four to six weeks is far too short to even think about this, to even think about this. Uh, so it needs to take more time before you even introduce the notion about the person who actually committed the crime against you. So we... Uh, started dialogue and mediation after serious crime, funded it from the beginning uh, from the uh, Victim uh, Compensation Support uh, Authority and also funded by other uh, local foundations. Um, and we started off with uh, marketing. Marketing is very important. Uh, how do you do marketing? Well, um, marketing with the police, in my experience, uh, you go to the police station and you say, can I, have, uh, can I bring some, um, some cakes and come to your uh, morning coffee break with cakes? And the police say, yep, cakes, we like cakes. Okay, so I come there and I provide the cakes and we have coffee and I talk mediation, restorative justice. And I make personal connections and I ask, can I come to your Monday meeting and talk about about these things, and they say, well, she sounds like an okay person. You can come to our Monday meeting. Okay, can I come? So I come to the Monday meeting, and I talk about restorative justice, and then I say, can, can I come to your regular meeting when you meet the social service agency and you talk about uh, the risk, uh, the, the youth at risk that you have uh, once every two months? And you say, sure, you can come to those meetings. And that's one way of, as my dear uh, mediator fr friend said, of infiltrating the police. She has long blonde hair and blue eyes. She's very good at infiltrating the police. And she's very good at starting mediation services. So uh, horses for courses, courses for horses. So uh, you can't do the same thing with the public prosecutor. No, no. No, there is a different tactic. And the tactic here is to invite them to lunch. Can we have lunch? And you set a date. You, you, you recognize this, don't you? Yeah? And the same with judges. You get invited for lunch, and then you say, can you come to your, to your meeting that I know you have once a month and talk about restorative justice? Okay. Yes, you can. And so that's another way of infiltrating 
the public prosecutor. Uh, we don't need to work so much with judges in Sweden, thank God. Um, it's enough for the public prosecutor. And we need to do this at all levels of society. So we have to have the right person at the national level that does it, and for us it's that Stockholm. And then we have to have the correct people at the regional level to do it. And then again at the local level. Um, when it comes to dialogue and mediation, we, we use this um, process that people go through. Uh, and we have to remember that when you either are a victim of a crime, directly or indirectly, the first phase is the shock phase. And very often that phase you go through when you are at the police station. So to understand what restorative justice is at that point is almost impossible. Uh, you need to go into the next phase, which is the reaction phase, and pass that phase, uh, because the reaction is when you feel the very strong emotions. That's when you need the support of a victim support organization. And I can also mention that the municipalities in Sweden have within their work, uh, victim support organizations for young people, often up to the age of 20. But adults don't get that natural support. But this is where you need to be able to voice all those very strong feelings, words, hatred, anger, frustration, and so on. And sometimes, uh, as a mediator, uh, I'm the first p person they meet. And, and you may think this will not be possible to have a meeting. But this is a phase that you go through, and, and it's important to be able to go through these phases as soon as possible. And, and there, it is possible to help. So you don't get stuck in the reaction phase, which, of course, uh, victims very easily can be, uh, with the help of support people, either uh, those that are professional, but also family and friends. And, and, and you get stuck in this, um, in this role. But you need to go uh, into the processing phase, and this is where uh, restorative justice processes become very, very important. And uh, to even start talking about the other person. Uh, in my experience, uh, uh, from a victim's perspective, uh, the offender is usually very big and, and up here, and, and a monstrous person. And then to be able to say, I've met this person. Um, he's quite small. He's quite tiny. He has quite difficulty in, in verbalizing what he thinks and what he feels. And to paint a different picture of who the offender is. So it becomes eventually uh, possible for a meeting where the victim can get a completely different picture of who this person is. And, and also here, uh, another story. And to be in those encounters where people actually change. And you can see the physical changes that people go through where they relax, lower their shoulders, breathe slower, and can smile again. It's very, very moving. Um, as I said, initially this was a victim-initiated uh, project in 2008. But as we see the years pass, uh, we're working more and more within prisons, uh, and it becomes offender-initiated. And I will give you some examples of this. Um, a lot of our work is done in a prison for female prisoners, which is just outside Gothenburg. And our contact points are the prison officers. And uh, often in the beginning, their concern is for the victims, uh, because the victims will phone the prisons. Uh, they are worried. They are worried what will happen when the prisoners start to have uh, permission, permission to be out in the society, usually in the beginning for a day. 
but then for longer periods. They want to know that the prisoner is not coming to this uh, city or this uh, village where I live, and then the prisoner will have restrictions. But they will never get to know why they have the restric restrictions, because this is not the, the role of the prison, prison officer to, to give information from the victim. And so they will phone us and say, uh, we are concerned about the victims. We're concerned about the victims. And I say, yeah. Uh, so where can I start? Do I start with the victim or do I start with talking with the prisoner? Uh, we began from, from the beginning. We always started with the victim uh, and it's difficult. Do you phone them? Maybe the crime was a murder and this is uh, the victims or the family and uh, maybe it was five, six, seven, eight years since the crime was committed. And to get a telephone call on your mobile out of the blue can be a shock. Uh, and it was a shock very often when, when we started to phone. Um, so the initial reaction is no, uh, which is very natural. So then we devised a way of, of, of writing a letter saying that uh, we've been saying very little, inclu including our brochure, and then saying, we are going to phone you at the latest at this date, but if you want to phone me before that date, please do, and if you get an answering machine, please leave a message and I will come back to you. Very simple, very clear instructions. That worked a lot better. Uh, but nowadays we always talk with the uh, offender first, even though it is so-called so victim-initiated to get the story and see what the possibility is. And um, phoning the victim or writing to the victim, the first contact, talking with the victim, I very often hear, you are the first person that has called me uh, to support me. And I said, well, the crime was committed six years ago and I'm the first person, yeah, yeah. One person said, yeah, they phoned from the social services a month after uh, the murder was committed, and they said, it'll get better. Uh, which is not a very empathic way of dealing with somebody that have lost the closest person that they love the best. Um, okay, I've realized the time's up. Can I just give a little example? Um, we are now work we're continuing working with these cases, and the cases take a very long time, a very long time, and we all usually get the, very mo the most serious cases, which is the cases of murder, uh, where, uh, in my experience, uh, many of the people in prison, they, it, they, just, they just don't happen to murder. They usually is other difficulties, uh, perhaps personality uh, disorders, um, perhaps other uh, psychological difficulties uh, behind. And not everybody is suitable in, in meeting um, the victim, I think, especially if the victim is young adults that were children when, when the crime happened um, and who are still vulnerable. And it is important to assess whether there's a genuine, uh, genuine willingness to put things right. And this is, I think, always the most difficult thing for a mediator to assess. Because what is to be genuine? What is to be genuine? But it's also to listen, I think, for the words that say, I genuinely regret stabbing um, Victoria's father 80 times. I genuinely regret this act from my heart, and I wish I could have had it undone. When this does not happen, uh, I think there is too big a risk of letting two people be in the same room. Then it's better to be the mediator that goes from the offender to the victim, from the victim to the offender, and talk about instead what will happen in the future, and how can we act when if and when we meet on the street or in the family. Okay, I'll stop there and I'll take questions.
Thank you very much, Eleanor, for this nice presentation. Es el moment perquè feu les feu preguntes i feu arribar totes les inquietuds que us ha generat la l'exposició de l'Eleanor. Algú trenca el gel? Can I just jump in? I can't hear the translation. I can't hear anything. Oh, well, never mind. Ah, oh, you're going to come and help me? Hola, bon dia. Volia fer una pregunta en relació a quin tipus de tipologies delictives... Volia fer una pregunta en relació a quin tipus de tipologies delictives es fa aquest tipus de mediació de la qual vostè ha parlat. I també comentar-li que en els temes de violència masclista aquí a Catalunya tenim una llei en la qual està prohibida la mediació, sobretot en relació a un tema de control psicològic que exerceix l'agressor, en el que es col·loca en una posició de poder i en el que moltes de les dones que estan en aquests processos estan en una situació de molta vulnerabilitat. Concretament nosaltres en aquest tema tenim la mediació prohibida sobretot perquè la justícia restaurativa en el tema de les víctimes està en un procés diguéssim que queda molt per fer. Gràcies. Echoes. Yes, I'll answer that. Um, now, there are two... two it's, it's not a simple answer because our mediation law does not prohibit, prohibit uh, uh, mediation in domestic violence nor in sexual crimes. It does not prohibit. No crime is uh, pro uh, prohibited. But um, when you look at the, into the preamble I, the text that was written before the law, which is in almost 100 pages, um, it is stated that when the crime is either of a domestic violent nature or a sexually, sexual crime, uh, you need to be careful. Uh, and um, you need, the, the mediator needs to have experience and competency in uh, conducting these sort of meetings. So that's the basis. Now, we have the same discussions uh, when it comes to these uh, meetings. Because there are uh, some mediation services uh, that are funded by the municipalities that are doing mediations in these cases, and very successfully so. There is also a strong uh, uh, group uh, against doing these sort of meetings, exactly because of the reason you stated, which is the power imbalances. And uh, there are uh, both the victim uh, conversation support authority that uh, say don't do uh, mediation in these cases, and also some of the, uh, how do you say, the women's um, refuge. But it's not a, a coherent group, because I've also worked with women's refuge, uh, people working there, that say these meetings are also needed. We have, uh, within the police, we have something called a dialogue police that works also in these cases, especially cases where one of the parties have a protected identity uh, or, or gets, a, so gets a new identity somewhere else. Because then uh, these, a meeting, uh, I wouldn't really call it a mediation meeting, I 